Imagine the world in the year 3000. How will we work, play, propagate, communicate, worship, wonder? What forms of bodies will we have? What kinds of technologies? What about sex, family, government, education, religion? How deep into space will humans have ventured? How long will we live? How strange will it be? It's fun to speculate, but foreseeing 3,000 may be more than amusement. Next, on Closer to Truth, can we imagine the far future? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Kuhn. Most of us don't know what we'll be doing a year from now. Why then should we possibly care about a thousand years from now? Surprisingly, the far future affects us today. Our time-traveling futurists will explain. Graham Molitor, author of numerous works on the future, is vice president and legal counsel of the World Future Society. Dr. Bart Kosko is professor of engineering at USC and author of The Fuzzy Future. Dr. Bruce Murray, a former director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is professor of planetary science and geology at Caltech. Dr. Gregory Stock, a biophysicist and MBA, is director of UCLA's program on medicine, technology, and society. And Edward de Bono, the author of over 30 books on thinking, teaches creativity around the world. Graham, your chief spokesperson for the World Future Society and the author of a book on the next thousand years. Considering the unimaginable advances in the last hundred years, how can you be presumptuous enough to predict the next thousand? The answer to that question, Robert, is pretty simple and straightforward, and that is that the way into the past is a long and meandering path, but it's an evolutionary one. Bart, you've stated that brains, which you like to call meat, uh, don't uh, communicate uh, very well, that uh, biology really isn't destiny, even maybe brains are the first efforts of uh, bad efforts of nature to, to compute with meat. Uh, are electronic chips destiny? Well, Robert, I don't know that electronic chips are, but I think some type of chips are. I would gamble that it would be plastic chips. But yeah, I think this is the issue that the brain may be a great marvel of science, but it's a fiasco of engineering. And we're going to be, in this century, re-engineering the brain a piece at a time, initially with implants and other supplements, and ultimately then outright replacement. So I think there's no question that in the distant future we'll play the music of the mind on different instruments than we currently do. Right. As you say, three pounds of meat. We'll be talking about that. Uh, Bruce, uh, you're president of the Planetary Society, which uh, is the largest public uh, participation organization about space. Space is very important. And you personally are a leading advocate of space exploration. A thousand years from now, where will humanity be in space? Well, of course, we don't know in a narrow sense, but we can envision possibilities. Mm -hmm. And certainly, the, our, the limitations of this corpus that we carry around with us will have been overcome in many ways, on Earth as well as in space. How far we go as corporal beings out there is anybody's guess. I'm a geologist by origin. I'm a fairly conservative person, so I have a hard time seeing much beyond Mars. <laughs> but we'll see. But I think, yes, the, the potentialities are enormous, and whether we really go, whether this part of you goes, or simply our senses, not my best part, and, our, and our brains go, <laughs> is really the big issue. Greg, uh, you're a biophysicist who studies the impact of technology on society. Your book, Meta Man, uh, conceptualizes the merging of humans and machines in a global superorganism. Uh, you're an optimist about the next thousand years. Uh, why? Well, I'm optimistic because it's sort of the underlying view that many people have that basically we're out of balance with the natural <clears throat> world and are moving towards some sort of a deadly reckoning is, I believe, absolutely wrong. This is a very robust development that is occurring. And it's one that is of extraordinary evolutionary significance. I think we're in the midst of an evolutionary transition that is, is as significant as that that occurred when single cells joined together 
700 million years ago to form multicellular organisms. And I think that very basic things are occurring now that are unprecedented in the history of life. Space travel, uh, genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, and that we... And this show. <laughs> and, well, I don't know about this show. <laughs> It'll be good, right, but these... We'll, are the... we'll leave that out. And uh, so it seems to me that we're opening towards an extraordinary moment. And to be alive now and being observers and participants and architects of this is, an, is something extraordinary. Ed, for four decades, you've been showing the world how to think uh, more creatively, how to break the constraints of traditional thinking. Are we seeing the year 3000 simplistically, uh, almost as the year 2000 on steroids? The answer is yes. I think the year 1000, perhaps one of the biggest differences from today, is that there'll be no more men. No more men. Uh, stick insects can have female stick insect children without any need for a man at all. Now, within about 10 years, we'll find out the hormone cocktail that produces this, and women can take this cocktail, have female children, no need for men whatsoever. Will the world be a better place? Uh, oh, yes. I mean, this, this, this film will be archival material. People will take it out on video and say, look, those were men. Aren't they funny? Well, we might even go further than that. Uh, one of the major issues is, is not just whether it's a male or female, but whether it's our carbon-based systems or, or silicon. Bruce, you've uh, thought a little bit about that. Yes. Um, what's going on in our own lifetimes is extraordinary development of computing, communications, things that operate, in, in our case, on, on silicon. And at the same time, the capability of a human being is about the same. For example, in terms of exploring, Ernest Shackleton was probably as good as any explorer out there right now. But the computational tools, the remote sensing tools, the communication tools, to say nothing of the biomedical and miniaturization ones, are exploding. And so clearly, we live in a human-machine fusion. When you see pictures of Mars, they only make sense here. It's when we see them. Our eyes are somehow transported there. And that's just the very beginning of this extraordinary period, which is really only a, mostly a few decades old. Bart, take us to the end of that period. Uh, give us your rendition of heaven, heaven on a chip. Well, what is heaven? Heaven's a place. All these women. <laughs> <laughs> heaven's a place where you can create worlds at will. And the ideal heaven is where you run the thing yourself. And the current means of getting there, so far as we know, uh, involve uh, well, what are they involved? There's no scientific evidence for them at this point. So I think we can reduce heaven, and we are doing it, to an engineering project. The demand for heaven's great. The evidence of the pyramids and every human heart to live beyond the biologically allotted time of the past. So as we transfer more from our atoms to bits of information in a computer chip or some kind of computational medium, where just by thinking, that act of volition we've created the world, I think we'll very much approximate. And I think the first stage of heaven will be the sensory orgies that uh, we'd imagine. And beyond that, I think we'd hit more higher spiritual so, so planes. What you're so saying I would go is further. that... I would argue that religion, as we currently know them, will survive the onslaught of science. There'll be great competitions among them. If I had to predict a winner a thousand years from now, I'd say Buddhism would win. Once you've, like the Buddha, had the big orgies and the feast, and after that to... Uh, uh, you know, break through to the other side but, and explore but your things is, we can't But is the consume. downloading of our personalities into, into silicon, into electronic chips, very much more sophisticated than anything we have today, so that you can live uh, virtually forever. Well, let's just take the example of your past. You can't remember what you were doing three years ago, but if you had that kind of experience uh, in a chip, you could not only relive it, you could edit it at will, modify it uh, a thousand times in a different way. So, of course. Maybe but, you wouldn't uh, want to. Remember maybe you wouldn't want to. I think the, the emphasis on machines, chips, and so on is a possibility. But there's so much more with what I call human software we haven't done. I mean, human language at the moment is incredibly slow and primitive. I mean, one of the things I've been working on is a language which is 20 times as fast as normal language and we'll go much faster than that, 50 times as fast, used by...